Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. I recently read a book written by Barbara Walters of ABC entitled How to Talk with Practically Anybody About Practically Anything. She's written about many of the famous people she's interviewed. She told about a woman whose husband was running for the President of the United States. She was suddenly thrown into the limelight, being interviewed on radio and television, speaking before large groups of people. When Barbara Walters asked her how she coped with this sudden fame and attention, the woman replied that at first, she was nervous, but she cured herself one day by deciding, I am the way I am. There are many people who find this idea comforting. Haven't you heard people say something similar? That's just the way I am, or I was born that way. I can't help it. In conducting adult seminars and working with students, I heard this idea so many times in so many different ways. I decided to devote one entire student presentation just to this idea. And I said, I hope at the end of 30 minutes, you're going to begin adding some words to that sentence. I am the way I am today, but I can change. After the presentation, I asked them to write down the answer to this question. If you could change one thing about yourself, what one thing would you like to change? And I was so surprised to find a high percentage of junior and senior high school students feeling they were overweight and that it affected how they thought about themselves, their friendships, their schoolwork, their lives. There are an estimated 79 million overweight people in America, 79 million. And it finally dawned on me, it's how we think about ourselves, that's what counts. If we're healthy and happy with who we are, then why should we change? But if we're not, then we should change. Jean Nidish had said it for 38 years, I am the way I am. She was 5'7", weighed 214 pounds, and wore a size 44 dress. She said, I used to ask myself, why am I fat? I don't eat that much. I never ate breakfast. I got nauseated just thinking about breakfast. Actually, she was a compulsive eater. She said, I'd get up at 3 a.m. and have a lamb chop sandwich between two slices of salami. I used to hide chocolate cake in the laundry hamper. She said, when I was in school, no one ever called me fat. They called me chubby. And by the time I was 15, I hated the word chubby. She said, I was always on a diet. I'd go on fat diets for a whole week. I would eat just one kind of food or nothing at all. I'd lose a little, and then I would reward myself for my sacrifices. She said, for the major portion of my life, I alternately starved my body or overindulged it. I saved diets. I pasted them in albums. I saved them in shoeboxes. I even labeled them. Likes don't like. Works doesn't work. She said, I even had an album of diets I wrote myself. Although I lost weight dozens of times, it always came back. And with the added pounds came the depression, knowing that once again, I was a failure. She said, some people need to be hurt badly before they do anything about themselves. Some people have told me that what finally changed them was the first time they stood up in a restaurant and the chair came up with them. She said, this is the way it happened to me. I was pushing my shopping cart in the supermarket when a girl I hardly knew came up to me and she said, Jean, you look absolutely marvelous. When's the baby due? She said, that hurt. That really hurt. She had said it for 38 years, but that day caused her to add some words to that sentence. I am the way I am today, but I can change. She went to a health obesity clinic. She was given a diet. She said, I had seen hundreds of diets before, but I felt this was my last chance, so I stuck with it. She lost 72 pounds in one year on a sensible, well-balanced diet and went in time from a size 44 to a size 12. She is, as you probably know, Jean Nidich, the founder of Weight Watchers. For 56 years, Patrick O'Kelly had been a sailor, sailing on any ship that would hire him. It was the only job he had ever known. After losing a lung in a cancer operation, knowing he would never be a sailor again, he remembers lying in his hospital bed thinking, what am I going to do now? How many people at age 15 or 40 or 65 say to themselves, what am I going to do now? 
when they lose the only job they've ever known, or when they don't even know how to go about finding a job. But O'Kelly had another problem. He had never learned to read or write. He didn't understand as much about the alphabet as a first grader. When a hospital volunteer asked him if he would like to take some correspondence courses to prepare himself for a new career, he was too ashamed to tell her that he couldn't read or write. He'd never told anyone that. When he finally told her, she asked if he would like to learn to read. It was humiliating to him as he sat in his bed trying to read, see the dog, see the dog run. Everyone in the hospital ward laughed at him as he tried to change something in his life that had always been so painful for him. Instead of lashing back at those who laughed at him or quitting because he was embarrassed, he laughed at himself right along with them. And soon it was like a game. It became fun as everyone tried to help him learn. Hour after hour, day after day, they would drill him on his lessons. His goal was to be able to read well enough to read the want ads. He continued learning, but was too sick to work. Because he needed money, he decided to write poetry about the sea. He finally got the courage to submit six of his poems, and three were accepted. Then he began writing children's books. At age 56, Patrick O'Kelly decided to change something that he had always been ashamed of. And when others laughed at him, he found that if you can learn to laugh at yourself, people will stop laughing at you and will laugh with you. Rex Reed has written about the movie star and Academy Award winner, Ellen Burstyn. He quotes her as saying, I was born poor, uneducated, and everybody laughed at everything I ever wanted to do with my life. Now I know I could have been a scientist, but nobody ever told me a girl could be a scientist. When I was 18, I set out to educate myself. I started by reading the encyclopedia and taking notes. I know everything there is to know about bridges and the history of architecture in England. I memorized all the state capitals and the names of the English kings. Then I saw somebody doing the New York Times crossword puzzle, and that became my college education. One puzzle would take an entire week because it had to be completely researched. I'd look up all the words in the dictionary, then use the encyclopedia, the World Atlas, every reference book I could find. I did that for five years while I worked as a short order cook, a sign painter, a fashion coordinator. It took me a year before I could even do half a puzzle. After five years, I could finally do them without reference books, and that is how I changed, how I educated myself, how I learned to think. When I was a sophomore in college, I was nominated by my sorority sisters for Miss University of Colorado when I was out of the room. I was so shy, I told them I couldn't possibly do it. But they said I couldn't decline because the meeting was over and every unit on campus had to have the nomination in by nine o'clock the next morning or they would be fined. The night of the pageant, I told the boy I was dating that if he walked into the auditorium, I would walk off the stage. And then when I won, it was only six weeks before the Miss Colorado pageant. I knew I would have to do something to overcome my almost paralyzing fear of standing up before an audience to speak. So I enrolled in a summer school course in public speaking. The first day we were to do a short reading or poem before the class. As my boyfriend was driving me to class, I recited what I was going to do and he laughed. He didn't mean to hurt my feelings or upset me, but he had no understanding of how shy I was or how difficult it was going to be for me. I guess I didn't appear to be as shy as I was. I never went to class that day. I never took the course. I faced the audience at the Miss Colorado pageant and five weeks later, the Miss America pageant, so shy and so scared, I couldn't sleep at night. It's taken me years to conquer my fear of speaking. Change has been a long and painful process. But it sure has been worth it. Ken Venturi wanted to change. He stammered so badly by age 12 that he couldn't even speak a full sentence. It was so embarrassing to him that he refused to speak in school or to talk on the telephone. Children laughed at him. He's left-handed. And as a boy, people kept trying to change him from being left-handed to being right-handed. It's now believed that this is what started his stammering. He wanted to change. What was so embarrassing to him 
He felt he had to do it alone, and so every day after school, he would go to the public golf course and hit balls. Every day for four years, he would play by himself. He pretended people were watching him play tournaments, and he would win, and explain to those imaginary people which club he would use and why and how to hit the different shots. He would even give the acceptance speeches for the tournaments. After four years of playing alone, every single day, he had cured his stuttering. And his career as a professional golfer had begun. He went on to win the most prestigious golf tournament of all, the U.S. Open. He conquered his stuttering problem so completely, he is now a television sports commentator for CBS. In 1962, Ron Lyle was convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 to 25 years in prison. That was in 1962. In 1972, the Denver Chamber of Commerce named him the Outstanding Young Man of the Year. Somewhere between 1962 and 1972, Ron Lyle changed. At age 17, he was convicted of second-degree murder and spent seven and a half years in prison before he was paroled. Let me tell you some of the feelings he's had. Let me quote his words. I was born into a family of 19 children. Think it's fun being black and coming from a family of 19? Well, take my word for it. It's no picnic. I used to steal things to make money. At first it was bicycles, then purses. I got caught and had to spend time in a reformatory. When I went to prison at age 17, I was bitter and at times a troublemaker. I got into a fight with another prisoner. He stabbed me in the stomach with a homemade knife. The tip punctured an artery near my spine, and the doctors could not stop the bleeding. I was declared dead twice on the operating table. They used 35 pints of blood during the seven-hour operation. After I got out of the hospital, I was put into isolation for 90 days. I had a lot of time to think. I decided I wanted something out of life better than I'd had. I decided to make sports my life and to be a success. I decided to change. As a starter in solitary confinement, I began working out. At the end of 90 days, I could do 1,000 push-ups and 500 sit-ups. I knew I wanted a boxing career and that I wanted to try to help kids get started in the right direction. Ron Lyle became one of the top-ranked heavyweight boxers in the world, and he also became involved in helping children. He was the chairman of the Colorado March of Dimes Walkathon. He personally led thousands of teenagers and volunteers on a 20-mile march. It was the most successful walkathon in their history. He was the chairman of the Denver Association for Retarded Children. The Denver Chamber of Commerce named him the Outstanding Young Man of the Year. From bitterness and hostility and crime to involvement and commitment, Ron Lyle changed. What would you like to change in your life? Are you unhappy with what you're doing? Or are you just wandering, wishing you could find something important to devote your life to? This was Mary Calderon's story. She wanted to be an artist, then a poet, then a pianist. For years, she kept throwing herself into new pursuits. She said, I just couldn't find what I wanted to do. But she kept looking. She didn't settle for that life of quiet desperation. She wasn't going to live a life of clock-watching or complaining. At age 31, she began to wonder if going into medicine wasn't what she really wanted to do. She began to feel so strongly about it, she said, for almost the first time in my life, I was being someone I liked. She was ten years older than anyone else at the University of Rochester, and it certainly wasn't easy. But she had found her life's work, not just a job, a career so exciting she couldn't wait to get up in the morning. How did it turn out for her, beginning med school at age 31, so difficult an age to begin anew? The world-famous Dr. Carl Menninger recently said, she is one of the great figures of our era, now 75, still involved and totally committed. An article in a major magazine recently stated, Dr. Calderon's work has profoundly changed the quality of life 
in this century. Her life changed because she changed it. And she kept changing it until at age 31, she could say, for almost the first time in my life, I was being someone I liked. She had found purpose. Is the name Rod Laver familiar to you? When he began playing professional tennis, he lost 21 out of his first 23 matches. He said, I was 25 and I was a tennis player and I thought if I wasn't going to be a winner, what was the point of it all? He was a loser, but he changed. He concentrated. He began to work on his weaknesses in tennis. He began to change them into his strong points. When he was a boy, his father thought his older brother would be the better tennis player. The tennis coach said, Trevor has beautiful strokes better than Rod's, but Trevor has an explosive temper. Rod is quiet and determined. Rod will make it. His brother did not overcome his temper. He did not change. And it was Rod who became one of the great tennis players in the world. Historic Wimbledon, Britain's shrine to tennis, is the scene once more of the finals in the men's singles championship. The two principals take the court. Rod Lever, Australia, left, and Chuck McKinley, first American in the finals in six years. Lever, on the other hand, has lost out twice after reaching the finals. Match point, and one of the greatest volleys ever staged on Wimbledon's hallowed court. Kinley goes down fighting as Labor, changing pace at will, finally puts over match point. It's a sweet victory for the 22-year-old redhead. This time, the Wimbledon crown did not slip from his grasp. The reward for his straight set victory is the trophy presented by the Duchess of Kent. The Duchess honors a king. One of the great college football coaches of all time was fired because he didn't change. Woody Hayes had always had an explosive temper, and it didn't seem as if he ever tried to change it, and it finally cost him his job. It ended his career in disgrace as literally millions of people watched the coach of Ohio State University, angry and frustrated because he was losing, swing at a player on the other team during a game. Not even his record of 238 wins, 72 ties, and only 10 losses saved him. He had lost his temper one time too many, and it cost him not just his job, but the career he loved, the coaching he lived for. The New York Mets baseball team was formed in 1962. In their first seven seasons, they finished last five times and next to last twice. They lost 737 games. Time magazine called them the most ludicrous team in the history of baseball. One of the rookie players said he found the business of losing day after day downright humiliating. He said the crowd would give you a standing ovation if you only caught the ball. It was an achievement just to play and not get hurt. Fans would come to the games with banners reading, We don't want to set the world on fire. We just want to finish ninth. There were only ten teams. But in the eighth year, it changed. The Mets began to win and win and win. They won, in fact, the World Series, and the longtime laughingstocks became the champions of the world. New York went wild, schools and offices closed, celebrations were everywhere. New Yorkers threw paper out of the window in a sort of ticker tape celebration. Any paper they could find, computer cards, torn up phone books, so much paper landed on the streets, cars skidded, horns were honking, people were cheering. Within one year, the Mets had changed. There were reasons for the change, of course. But the point to remember is that for seven years, they were losers, laughed at, and within one season, they were the world champions. Some of you may be on top of the world. You may have worked very hard for your accomplishments, or you may have found that you've been quite lucky. No matter how it has happened, it's important to remember that Nothing stays the same. There will be change. Just like a plant. We either grow or we die. Nothing stays the same. You will either continue to excel and become more accomplished, or you will decline. Let's look at the television networks. For 21 years, CBS had been number one. And for years, NBC was number two. And ABC? Well, ABC was laughed at. 
For years, many people joked that there were two and a half networks. But it changed. And ABC went from being the lowest in 1975 to being number one in 1976. And by 1978, ABC had gone right off the charts with the number one position. There are always reasons for change. Sometimes people or companies in the top positions don't keep growing. William Paley said CBS's problems started years ago when we ran out of new shows, attractive new shows, to replace the older shows that were starting to lose audiences. Maybe we were too satisfied and content. It was careless, and it should not have happened. By 1980, it had changed again, and CBS had pulled ahead of ABC. You can be the winner today and the loser tomorrow. You can also be the loser today and the winner tomorrow. Perhaps the greatest example of this in American history is Richard Nixon. An interesting story. He started his career as an attorney and was elected U.S. Senator at age 33. He was re-elected at age 39. Eisenhower selected him as his vice presidential running mate. They won. They were re-elected in 1956. But it can change. In 1960, with four successful elections behind him, he ran for president against John F. Kennedy and lost by one half of one percent. It was the closest vote in American history. Two years later, he decided to run for the governor of California. The Saturday Evening Post said, if Pat Brown wins, Nixon is finished. If Nixon can't win California, his home state, he would be a flimsy political candidate for 1964. He didn't win, and this time he was defeated by more than 300,000 votes. Time magazine wrote, barring a miracle, Nixon is finished. For eight years, he was labeled a loser. He had lost the presidency and the California governorship. Six years later, at age 55, he decided to run again. To win just the Republican nomination, he had to run against Governor Romney of Michigan, Governor Rockefeller of New York, and Governor Reagan of California. What chance would you have given him? How and why did he win? During those six years, he had traveled hundreds of thousands of miles from Maine to Hawaii. During the 1966 election campaign alone, he campaigned for 105 local and state candidates. Nixon won the nomination and ran against Humphrey for the presidency. Nixon won by only four-tenths of one percent. In 1972, he ran again against McGovern and won by the greatest popular vote in history. And in 1974, Nixon became the only president in American history to be forced to resign in total disgrace. You can be the loser today and the winner tomorrow. You can be the winner today and the loser tomorrow. You will change. Nothing stays the same. Everyone changes. And I suppose everyone would like to change in some way. I was fascinated to learn how Benjamin Franklin changed. If the six greatest Americans in history were to be listed, he would certainly be among them. No other American, except perhaps Thomas Jefferson, has ever done so many things so well. In reading his autobiography, I was intrigued to learn that he thought about himself as a man of ordinary ability. He'd only had two years of schooling. But he believed he could become a man of exceptional success if he could just find the way to do it. He wanted to improve himself. And he wanted to overcome some bad habits. He did change, and this is how he did it. He listed 13 characteristics that he wanted to acquire or master. Every week, he would concentrate on trying to do one of them. The third week, for example, he worked on being more orderly, organizing his thoughts, having everything in its place. The 11th week, he worked on 
tranquility, trying not to be angry or upset by unimportant things or by things he couldn't avoid or control. Each day he would put a little black dot on his chart if he didn't follow through. After 13 weeks, devoting one week to trying to perfect each one, he would start over and do the list again. He said by daily practice, it wasn't long before these were a permanent part of my character. When he was 79 years old, he said he felt this one thing accounted for all his success and happiness. In his autobiography, he devoted 15 pages just to this idea. He wrote more about this than anything that ever happened to him in his entire life. This man who signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, who founded the University of Pennsylvania and served as minister to France, think of the incredible experiences of his life, and yet he attributed his success and happiness to this one idea. If Benjamin Franklin, one of the most outstanding men in history, believed this was the most important thing he ever did, isn't it worth considering? He didn't just say, I am the way I am. He did change because he wanted to, planned how he would do it, and then disciplined himself to follow his plan. Isn't it worth trying? Why not write down just one thing you would like to change about yourself? One thing you would devote a week to thinking about, concentrating on? Would it be how you spend your time, your weight, your temper? Self-discipline, being cheerful instead of complaining all the time. You can change from unemployed to a rewarding new job, from drugs to freedom from addiction, from shy to confident, from average to outstanding. And now is the time. Make this your moment of decision. Face whatever you have to face and get it over with. The longer you delay, the harder it will be. I am the way I am today, but I can change. And I will begin right now. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Think about it. You can begin all over. You can begin the rest of your life today. No matter what you've done or how you've lived, you can change. The question is, will you?